Hello, everybody, and welcome to Wrestling of Statistics, the only show that looks at the world of professional wrestling through the lens of stats, analytics, and everything in between. I am your host, as always, Ryan Nightstein. With me, as always, is the man behind Pro Wrestling Musings, Craig. Craig, welcome to the show. Welcome. Get into the pool. It's full of uh, Cody Rhodes sweat. Okay, it's now the pool's gross. Broken down okay, TNT stats. titles. Just say stats. No, Graphs. it's you went weird. No, I'm going weird because we're now we're taking a deep dive into Cody Rhodes' title reign. That's what I was trying to get to. Uh, how are you doing, Craig? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm doing doing pretty well. Um, <laughs> I I see you've decided that you're a proper pod- podcaster now because you're wearing a hat whilst podcasting, yes. which all podcasters seem to do for some strange reason. My my theory on that is because, and it's the same for these, and I do it, is because podcasters, um, when they have to do video calls, they'll put on a hat because they are not. <laughs> they they're like, oh, the reason I do podcasting is because I don't look, uh, the greatest right now, and my hair is all out of control. So I was like, I'll just put a slap a hat on. Why not? You know what I mean? Slap a hat on to make it a little bit more prettier, as it were. Um. Mm. I, I don't know. Does that make sense? I don't know. I As you can tell already, Craig, I've sort of been losing my mind. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've been I've been combing over the data in preparation. Too many for this. charts. Too many charts. Too many tables. Um, I am the table on this episode. Uh, so, yeah, we've been... <laughs> uh, yeah, as you... I'm sorry, audience. I've been going a little cuckoo. So, uh, in preparation for this episode, if you don't know... We are going to be taking a deep dive into the 10-match title reign of Cody Rhodes' TNT Championship, all the way from Archer, when he won it at Double or Nothing, all the way to the leader of the Dark Order, the exalted one, Brody Lee. Sorry, Mr. Brody Lee. Um, what, two weeks ago, I think, at the time of the recording? Um, uh, yes, there's been one episode since... So we are going to be taking a deep dive into that. We also have some New Japan talk, but uh, we'll, we don't know how deep of a dive this will be. So if we get to it, we get to it. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess without the... I mean, we can summarize the New Japan just now if you want. Do you want to, as a teaser, we'll summarize it. And if we don't get it, we've summarized it. So there we go, audience. Yeah. Um, Evil put in the worst statistical performance that I've seen in the last 12 months of doing this. 18 off- offensive moves from Evil, 23 illegal actions from Evil in a 20, what was it, 26, whatever it was, match. 26, Absolute 20. disgrace. Absolute disgrace. What about the tag match? We're, this this is going to be our pre-show banter is us combing through <sighs> real quickly the uh, New uh, Japan the tag, tag. tag match was fine, made Kota Bushi look good. Finished a little abruptly. Um, the stats say that Golden Ace were in charge for the whole thing, and then Dangerous Techers just won. That was about it. Got the uh, surprise finish there. I told mm. well, I, when I was watching this match, my girlfriend was sitting on the couch, and I turned to her. Mm. I was like, "How old do you think Kota Bushi is?" And she was like, "I don't know, mm. late late twenties." I was like, "Ooh, no, <laughs> <laughs> almost forty. There is a five year difference between Abushi and Tanahashi, and you cannot tell by their wrestling." Uh, what about yeah. the uh, junior heavyweight match, Hiromu and Taiji? Um, yeah, it was it was actually a very impressive performance from Ishimori again from a statistical point of view. 49% reversal rate, I think it was. Um, reversal rates usually come in at like uh, teens, 20s, sometimes into the 30 if it's a bit of a noteworthy performance, but 49% is huge. Um, essentially means that almost one in two of the moves that... Takahashi threw his way was reversed, which is um, very unusual. Very impressive as well. Uh, mm-hmm. yeah, and then absolutely. finally, Shingo versus Minoru. Uh, well, Min- the the headline, st- headline statistic here has to be that um, Big Bad Minoru Suzuki threw 105 strikes. Um, big number, big for stats. Um, I don't think anybody listening to this podcast is going, whoa, can't believe that Minoru Suzuki threw 105 strikes. Yes, yes, you absolutely can believe that. I would argue that 105 is probably on his low end. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I I think it was something similar to that against Nagata, but Nagata threw like even more. That was, yeah, just strikes. Yeah, and also the submissions as well. Like you, you, you could look at this and like, yeah, I can see why Minoru won a little bit more here. I mean, and also mm-hmm. just the flow of offense charts as well. And that's how you, and that's a quick review 
four matches from New Japan. That is how, that's yeah, how you do a done. quick quick review in th- I think three minutes, two minutes. That's what that's what it was. Uh, it was essentially one statement per match. Basically, well, if we get to it, we get to it, Craig. Uh, and if not, uh, audience, you can always go to prowrestlingmusings dot com or uh, PW Musings on Twitter, and you can I always mean, to be to be frank. I don't know if I have too much more to say on any of those matches. That's also true. But that if you want to, see, if you want to see those those images and look at the graphs yourself uh, and review the match yourself, I guess, <laughs> then uh, get get off come our listen, back. Come listen to our come listen to our podcast. Yeah, wh- why are Here's... you coming? Why are you coming here for that? <laughs> <laughs> Do it yourself. <laughs> Do it your goddamn self. Um, yeah, but you can go to prowrestlingmusing.com and check out those graphs on your own time. Deep dive. Let's get to it. I'm ready, Cody Rhodes. Here we go. Deep dive, Cody Rhodes, TNT title reign. That's the theme song that gets us into the movement. Um, Craig, on a whole, thoughts on Cody's TNT title reign? Uh, you know, from the beginning to the end, did you think it was a success? Um, any positives, negatives to the whole thing? What are your overall takes? Well, uh, I mean, I mean, somebody has to say it. This is just like utter garbage. And um, we're going to change the universe. We're going to be the hip wrestling company. And Cody Rhodes just turned into Triple H and buried everybody left, right, and center. What an absolute disgrace of a man, liar. At least Triple H has <laughs> never claimed to be changing the universe. And if anything, he he told us that we would be in charge, Triple H. I mean, what mm. Chevrolet is, I mean, he's, he's the golden God, if you will. He's, the yeah. Champion. I mean, at least, at least it's our fault when things don't go well in WWE. Cody Rhodes said he was going to do it all for us and he just buried everyone. Yeah. No wonder he's a prince. Triple H is the true King of Kings. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, um, I, I th- I'm, I'm, yeah. I'm pretty certain that the Scottish sarcastic humor is pouring <laughs> out here right now, Craig. Yeah. I mean, but like, that is not a take that, um, that, like you haven't seen on the internet people are saying that people are saying that he's like triple h and i i mean i may have said something along those lines after he beat archer but like i was very wrong and he ha- has not been triple h in disguise he has put people over left right and center he has two people on his roster now that got matches uh, that got contracts after wrestling him um, he, his like we've spoken about before that warhorse match when the match wasn't picture in picture when it was on full screen TV Cody Rhodes barely got any offense in and the man has put people over he's created a monster in Brody Lee two people have got jobs guys like Mark Quinn uh, Sonny Kiss so much better off for having faced Cody Rhodes uh, the, the, the whole thing has been the best thing in wrestling for the last couple of months and yeah the the man has you know been very much the anti triple h 100% agree i it, it's easy on the surface to look at you know cody rhodes defeating mm-hmm. well defeating nine people i guess defeating defeating nine people and being like yeah. oh he's burying people because he mm-hmm. he wins a lot and it's weird that people don't say that about like MJF or Moxley, but um, mm-hmm. you know, you look at it on the surface and you're like, oh, he's he's beaten people nine times in a row. How dare he? And you know how he's burying people. But the and the thing that we've discovered and that we've been trying to say through the show is that he's not. It's not a burial. It's easily not a burial. Um, you can maybe mm-hmm. argue that for like mm-hmm. one or two matches, but. At the end of the day, I, he's. I don't. I don't even know because, like, people people would probably point towards Jake Hager and say he buried him. But like, after the John Moxley match, Jake Hager was in a bad position. Like, he wasn't looking good. The match against Cody was better. It wasn't as good as Dave Meltzer tried to tell us. Um, <laughs> but it, it was it was better than the Moxley match. It made Jake Hager look slightly better. And not only that, but you can read all about it in my uh, article that I wrote, my my debut article that I wrote wrote for mm. uh, ProWrestlingMusings.com. So thank you for Craig for allowing me to publish there. But uh, it might it might be the best statistical wrestling article I've ever seen, and that's that's not me um, trying to flog the brand or put over the podcast hosts. That is pretty genuine. I well, I appreciate that, Craig. 
um i i i I told you i don't write many articles but when i do i come out (laughs) swinging uh swing for the fences but as you can so you can go there's gonna be by time this podcast is out there should easily be uh, the full article released as well but so you can go back and read all about my sort of thoughts match by match as well and talking about the hager match uh you just looking at that one match Mm -hmm. Hager was in control pretty much the entire time. We didn't talk about the Hager match on the show, but you have to remember that he, you know, Cody might have gotten 55% of the match offense. Cody might have, you know, gotten, uh, pulling up here, you know, one in how many of those categories? Four out of 13 categories. Um, so not a lot, but uh, he might have won that. But you also forget that, like, that. Was, I would not argue that was a burial. I would argue that Cody got lucky. Because the finish of that match was yeah. Cody and the ankle lock getting slapped by Hager's wife. Dustin comes out to stop it. Cody reverses the ankle lock, lock into a roll up and wins the match. If that's not yeah, if that's not lucky, I don't know what is. Yeah, but like we've also seen that statistically big men in AEW often get less offense also because true. the yeah the the offense is used to put over how big and imperious they are. So like for for a long time, Lance Archer had taken more offense than he dished out. Mm-hmm. And nobody for we weren't for a second suggesting that Lance Archer had been harmed more than he'd harmed his opponent. And um, the the mere the mere thought of that statement is kind of giggle inducing. And um, but like, you know, when he's against Marco Stunt, Marco Stunt will like any possible chance he gets, he'll hit him with like eight or nine quick punches that are like where his hand essentially bounces off Lance Archer. And, you know, the the offense there is used to put over how big and strong he is. So, yeah, that'll be, that. you know, that's the same. That's the same in this match. Cody gets more strikes than Jake Hager, but his strike down rate is 0%, whereas um, Jake Hager's strike down rate is 20%. So, yeah, it's, um, it's not, it's not, um, it's not as simple as who got the bigger number. I wonder if there is some sort of way that we can dive into that when it comes to the hosses of AEW and look at to see if there's some sort of connection between Mm -hmm. I want my theory is I wonder if there is the, if you're a hoss, you throw less Mm -hmm. strikes, but have more strike downs. I wouldn't sense. know. I'm 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 decidedly not a horse. <laughs> but I wonder. Maybe that's a question for Rob to figure out. But I wonder if like there's. <laughs> are, you, are you suggesting that Rob is a horse? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. Of course. One hundred percent. He has he has big I, I don't hot, know. He has big I, I horse don't know. energy. Is that, is, um, is that complimentary? Or are you taking shots at somebody that you never met? <laughs> I mean. Uh, I'd say I'd say being a hoss is complimentary. Have you met Lance Archer? Okay. Have you met Brody Lee? Have sure, you met sure, Jake yeah. Hager? I would say that's a compliment. Um, Viscera, yeah. <laughs> well, let's get into the actual discussion of Cody's deep dive. Obviously, like I said, there's a full article that you can read into where I give my thoughts match per match and sort of kind of what the week to week storytelling of it all was. Um, but I try to break it down as much as possible for y'all as well, because I'll be the, and again, these are all Craig's stats. So, and then I'm just compiling the numbers here, but uh, I guess our first graph that we'll open up with real quickly is the Cody's match offense percentage, strike down rate percentage, reversal rate percentage across all TNT title matches. You can see it on the screen. Now, if you're on the YouTube version of this show, where you can go and find at hit the books podcast on YouTube, you can find that there. Uh, or, Sorry, of course... I'm just going to jump in very quickly. Um, I know that sometimes when I read articles on things, I tend to just, like, look for the charts that kind of illustrate the point because, you know, millennial laziness. <laughs> um, if you are looking just to be able to quickly look at the charts, there are 38 charts in this article. Yes, and, I, and I t- as I told you, as I told you before... Uh, we started recording. I may add more. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, so it could easily, I think it could easily reach 40. Uh, nice. Good. By me coming up with more ideas. But uh, starting with this chart, it's sort of basically, I, I wanted to convey and try to see how Cody's, you know, offense percentage, strike down rate, all this sort of stuff progressed throughout his title mm-hmm. reign. 
Because I think it's fair to say, you know, this title reign was a little bit of a marathon. It was Mm -hmm. 10 matches, I believe, in the span of 15 weeks. I would have to double double back that. But all the way from May 23rd at Double or Nothing to August 13th. I mean, at at worst, you'll be out by a week or two. But yeah, like, yeah, three, four months. Absolutely, yeah. He's he's working hard. So I thought it was mm-hmm. fair to theorize that Cody's match offense percentage, the you know percentage of match percentage of the match that he is in control, one could, one could say uh, he it would would go down right from week to week. It would probably go down. Yeah. And seeing at this graph, um, I, what are your sort of takeaways? I guess based off this graph, Greg. Well, well, it 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 certainly does. Um, he Cody hits a point where um, he's beginning to struggle. Um, he starts off as uh, strong, maybe the stronger champion. Um, actually, I don't know. I think I think actually I'm being um, kind of gazumped by the numbers here. Um, I think the reason that he looks strong at some points is because he has won maybe two strong matches that sunny kiss number where he has 64 percent of the offense and mm-hmm. um, i think drags it up he's he's kind of averaging just just above half of the offense in his matches until he hits sunny kiss and then after that he's struggling he's he's pretty gassed by the time he gets to the war horse he gets a little bit of a break improves a bit and then you know he's 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 done in by the time he gets to Brody Lee whether or not he would have any chance against Brody Lee I wouldn't like to say but you know um, yeah it, he he went on a noble quest and eventually the quest caught up with him this is a company that, that does not book superheroes He Cody Rhodes is not John Cena nor would we want him to be he defended the championship eight times and then eventually got beat in such a short space of time. That's a good story. That makes sense. That's mm-hmm. booking a wrestling company for adults to watch. And um, yeah, you know, big fan of this big fan. Yeah. When I talk about more graphs that are probably going to be addition to this article, mm-hmm. the uh, first and second half of these, this title reign is probably going to be looked into because there is definitely mm-hmm. a story there. We are talking about, yeah. The first five matches, Archer, Boy, Quinn, Starks, and Hager. You know, he Cody has the average match offense mm-hmm. percentage at the very start. He has a very solid average match. Gets a tiny bit more offensive against Jungle Boy. Starts dropping to 50, 47% of the match offense. He gets a week off to prepare for Jake Hager where he shoots back up from 47 to 55% of the match offense, which is very nice. He gets another week off to rest uh, because the second week off is fight for the fl- or fighter fest night two mm-hmm. comes back faces sunny kiss. This is match. Number six is against sunny kiss. The start of the second half of his title reign. And he comes out swinging with the highest match offense percentage. He has in his tire reign, 64% an insane number but then immediately next week obviously it's also a no dq match we are bringing cody all the way back down to his almost lowest 46 percent. a week after that 39 percent. his actual lowest against warhorse then 41 against sky then 48 which is you know 48 he mm-hmm. he it's all that one's a hard one that one's kind of an outlier but the basic idea here is that like if in the middle of the week, in the in the middle of the title reign with Hager and Kiss, if Cody did not have those weeks off, mm-hmm. we might we might have seen him change the title earlier. Um, you know, storyline yeah. kayfabe wise, that those yeah. weeks off really helped him, uh, and just Brody Lee picked up the pieces at the very end of the marathon. Yeah, which is really interesting. Like, do you do you think that like AEW? think like this is this coincidence that allows us to then talk a narrative around the numbers or are are they like are they telling cody to go out against war horse and scorpio sky and be struggling because he has defended the title so much 
or is this just coincidence and he wanted to put those wrestlers over stronger? I want to say it's hard to say whether or not they purposely are like, you know, mm-hmm. Tony Khan's an analytics guy and he loves all those numbers as well. And he, of course, has Chris Mookie Gana Harrington in his corner as well to help mm-hmm. when when need need arises. And it's hard to say, but I think at the I think it's a little bit of column A, a little bit of column B. You can easily say coincidental, but at the same time, I'm sure Cody's not thinking about, oh, I'm going to get, you know, two thirds of the match offense in a thing against Sonny Kiss, or I'm going to get one third of the match offense against Warhorse. But I'm sure Ryan. in his head that he's thinking, I want to put over Warhorse, so I'm going to make, make him have all mm-hmm. as much offense against me on TV as he possibly can to make him look be- look good. Brian, do you, do you remember which event um, AEW featured the Pro Wrestling Musing stats in their actual broadcast? Uh, Jake Hager, fight, uh, Fighter Fest Night 1. Mm, maybe that's when they start thinking about this kind of thing. Ooh, you're saying that you were the... Uh, uh, or Sorry, I'm, not you, I'm, the um, brand. <laughs> I'm I'm saying that I may have influenced the booking of Cody Rhodes's title wow. run. Wow! What a what a take! <laughs> what, what a take! Um, looking at the rest of this graph, I mean, we're we're obviously focusing on the match offense percentage, which I honestly I think that's the biggest part of this graph to me. Any thoughts in, in terms mm-hmm. of the strike down rate percentage, reversal rate? You can look at that trend line there, and it's you know you look when you're talking about trend lines, it's basically any number between zero and one. This trend lines there are 0.01, so it's very small, very yeah. minuscule. Still a decline, as you can see, but uh, very much still uh, not really much of anything. Is there any sort of takeaway that you can pull from either the strike down rate or the reversal rate, Craig? Um, I think there's probably more cause to suggest that the declining match offense trend line might be deliberate um the strike down rate and the reversal rate i think that's coincidental probably linked to the fact that he's putting his opponents over more as we get into eddie kingston warhorse scorpio sky territory um but it, it i don't think it's as overt here i think um he's not thinking oh i i need to strike down less he's not thinking I need to not be able to reverse as much. I think that's just happening as as he's trying to give his opponents more offense. I, th- I think I think those two lines slightly decreasing is a side effect of the overall offense. The blue line de- de- decreasing. I you brought up a point also at the very before we started recording that there seemed to be some sort of trend that we'll talk about later in the show with the strike down rate percentage with specific wrestlers from Cody. Yeah. Two yeah, percent yeah. against Archer, uh zero against Hager, Kingston is four, Brody Lee is zero. You know, skipping over Sunny Kiss there, but uh um the the idea there that Cody's strike down rate against these hosses, against these big guys is minimal at best. Yeah, yeah, and you can even look you can even look at the twenty five percent for Jungle Boy and Warhorse. Cody's um, the role in those matches is as the bigger guy, mm-hmm. so he's striking them down to put over the fact that they're the small guy underdog. So their strike down rates are much smaller, whereas his are is big. It, it's the way the wrestling companies book, and this is this is to nobody's surprise. But the numbers backs it up, and um, the big men quite often have less strikes because they absorb more of the strikes to put over the fact that they're you know the immovable object but mm-hmm. the uh, trade-off there is that they get the strike downs there when they hit their hands are heavier yeah and and i i don't really personally i don't really have a take in terms of the reversal rates it for me i, mm-hmm. I it's it, even though it's a little a tiny bit a minuscule hair higher than his strike down rate percentage in terms of that trend line i mean I, I don't know. I, I don't really I don't have a huge takeaway. The numbers are kind of over the place. It's he it's low with Quinn and Kingston, where in those mm-hmm. two instances, Kingston of course was a no DQ match, so why yeah. reverse when you can just hit your guy with a chair? And yeah. Quinn I wonder I, I wonder why Quinn is so low of a reversal rate. And I think part of it could be the fact that that was if look back on it, that was a match where Quinn was coming in with a hurt ankle from two weeks previously. So, 
he might not have been reversing a lot and instead of just during that match that was a leg work match through and through so in that match he's not really reversing he's just constantly going after that leg and maybe that's why yeah. that number is so slow so so in that match cody got six reversals and quinn got 12 i think the story being told there is that when cody is u- using um when cody is using his offense quinn is reversing a lot to stay alive mm-hmm. whereas when quinn is hitting moves um they they're they're kind of they're few and oh, i don't know i'm losing track of my <laughs> um i don't know it's quite hard to explain what what the reasoning there is i suppose the re oh no here it is uh the reason there is that when cody um reverses in that match then he makes it count he hits a lot of moves mm-hmm. whereas quen is reversing quite a lot when he has control cody tries to um tries to what happened in that match was that quen reversed more of cody's reversals so like quen would take control again cody would try to you know get out of it or to throw a punch to break up quen's attack and then quen would um reverse again so it was it was very much a case of cody was the was the kind of big man in that match and quen was having to reverse a lot to even hold on to his small um, his small openings of offense. There was also the, pa- the fact that he slipped two or three times because of that knee, hmm. meaning that Cody didn't even need to reverse. He was just, you know, um, Quen's knee buckled or he slipped off the top rope. So that match is a bit of an anomaly, as in um, Cody was the was a, the beneficiary of um, tide changes in that match because Quen just wasn't in a physical state to properly compete that was also another point i brought up during the article was that i started to notice this idea that cody he is a veteran he's a skilled veteran at this point wrestling for i want to say 10 to 15 plus years 10 to 15 would be my guess yeah um i can't even look it up he's he's 35 he 14 years of experience very close um, but he, he, you know, he knows what he's doing at this point. He, mm-hmm. and a point I was trying to think of is that he reverses a lot in his matches, reverses a lot of moves, but when he reverses, he follows it up. He pick, he yeah. get, takes that opportunity to take advantage of that opportunity. He's not just reversing to try to stay alive like Mark Quinn, which of course, you know, he was getting his leg worked on. So he's trying to stay alive actively, but he is he reverses and tries to follow it up directly by trying to get the win in. He's he he waits his he waits his moments to get in. I, I thought I talked about that with Archer where Archer was in a lot of ways a very much a lot of a, a Mike Tyson type where um you know Cody's mentality in that one was I'll take some punishment from the murder hawk monster, but after a bit he's gonna get tired and I can catch him while he's going while he's in the air with that blackout Cody reverses it into two mm-hmm. crossroads you know he's yeah. i'm going to i'm going to take it when i can get my spot in i'm going to take advantage of it mm-hmm. um let let's oh you got something I think, yeah i think it's a tactic they're using in specific matches um to to put over um so for example in the match against Sonny Kiss where um Sonny Kiss is you know definitely the underdog in that um Sonny Kiss is reversing a lot so um Cody will reverse and then Sonny Kiss reverses and then Sonny Kiss has to reverse again hits a couple moves then has to reverse again to keep control so it seems to be a, t- a tactic that's used by AW to write stories where um, the underdog is having to work so hard to stop the uh, the, the stronger wrestling wrestler from wrestling back the ascendancy in the match that's a good point let's move on to the next chart here and at that point we'll talk about the this is a chart that talks about the percentage difference between Cody's TNT title matches and matches prior. So basically, uh, mm-hmm. Craig obviously has been compiling all of his numbers from the entire year of 2020, which at time of recording, let me pull it up real quickly, how many matches Cody has had this year. 
um, that have been as that gets pulled up. But basically, what I did is that I took that num took his total number of matches, subtracted all the data from this TNT tower run, all the strikes and strike downs, all the matches. You know, figured out what those previous matches average mm -hmm. were. Then you know, figured out what the percentage difference was. Was it you know, was it a 5% de decrease? Was it a 5% increase? Yeah. Was he getting better? And I have this graph to sort of showcase that. Um, I think there's a lot of cool, interesting takeaways from this chart. Craig, I'll throw it to you first. So, sorry, just so I'm understanding. So essentially this graph is a comparison between Cody's performance as TNT champion versus Cody's performance before he was TNT champion. Correct. Did he get yeah. better in certain aspects? Did he get mm -hmm. worse? Um, how was he in this TNT title reign compared to what he's been previously in the year so, 2020? So essentially, he's just he was knackered, really. <laughs> yeah, I would say that. <laughs> I would say that. Why, why do you say that? Well, it's all red. Um, <laughs> he was throwing less strikes. He was certainly throwing less strike downs. He was throwing slightly less grapples. Uh, diving stopped and um, he's changed his game to incorporate more submissions and um, which obviously exerts less energy he was reversing less um interestingly though his pin attempts went down i'd expect that to go up if he was like really eager to get out of matches he's doing less fouls though which is interesting because there seem to be almost heelish tendencies um cropping in he's taunting more as champion though which does kind of feed into that prince of pro wrestling storyline um, and his finish, his use of finishers goes up, which I don't really know what to make of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the big takeaways I got, I love that his fouls, he has a 16% decrease in fouls, mm. but a 38% increase in taunts. Like, it, yeah. we, there was sort of the idea that he was sort of becoming more and more heelish through here. And in a weird way, oh. if, you, if you could argue that heels throw more fouls, uh, then uh -huh. you can argue that he was acting less heelish in this TNT title reign, mm -hmm. just way but more you, confident. Yeah, but if you ask people, if you ask people, do you think Cody um, committed more fouls in this run versus before? I think people would say more in this run because there's a lot of discourse around um, Cody becoming a bit of a heel and doing, you know, doing doing whatever it takes in these matches. Which and, is, yeah, it's interesting. And that would make sense. And that would make sense. I mean, if you want the specific numbers of each of these categories, I can give them to you as well, Craig. But uh, when it comes to the fouls, his... I mean, it's it's not a huge number. I mean, the number of fouls already is a small number. But yeah. the average fouls thrown in matches in his TNT title run was 1.4. In matches mm -hmm. previous, it was 1.63. It's, sure. it's a tiny difference, but it's still 16% decrease. Um, so it's essentially the same. Essentially the same. Uh, still a decrease, but still kind of very similar. Um, and then similarly looking at, but even, but still at the end of the day, that's still saying that, you know, it's a small number and a small difference, but at the end of the day, he is still fouling less in this TNT title reign than he did previously in 2020, which to me is very weird to think about. Cause you're right. The, a lot of the discourse has been that, Oh man, Cody's doing a lot of extra stuff here. Mm -hmm. Uh, in terms of seeming like a heel. And I wonder if that, now that I think about it, I wonder if that has actually, what p people see as heelish behavior is taunting. He, and because he is, his taunting is 38% higher than previously, which to me is like, oh, he's confident, right? He knows what he's doing. Yeah. So I wonder if the reason he's taunting a lot is making it, as like, oh, he's sort of a heel because he's not taking this seriously or he's hyping himself up during the match. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, it might just have been that in like a specific match, people picked up on a couple of fouls and then that meant that, you know, confirmation bias, people were looking looking for it in the future. That's true. Um, the one against Sonny Kiss, he used three fouls, Sonny Kiss used zero why, why would a face use fouls against somebody like Sonny Kiss? It's a bit like kicking a puppy because, like, Sonny Kiss comes across yeah. so, you know, so, like, such a nice person. Um, one foul to zero against Warhorse again. Why are you fouling against the indie wrestler? You know, as 
But then again, saying that, Scorpio Sky, zero fouls to two from Scorpio Sky. So it's, I, yeah, I think I think it's a case that a couple matches have stuck in people's head, perhaps. This is a very specific question, but when you were counting the fouls in each of these matches, mm-hmm. were you counting just the fouls performed by Cody, or were you including um, distractions or whatever by Arn Anderson? Arn Anderson doesn't really distract. He did in the Mark Quinn match. There was something about sure. Ar- okay. Arn tried to get involved in some capacity and actually yes, helped I think Mark I can... Quinn remember that now that you say Cody has one foul in the Mark Quinn match versus zero for Mark Quinn, so perhaps that one. Um, it could also be the ring post attack where Cody wraps Mark Quinn's leg around a ring mm-hmm. post. Uh, yeah, I do, it's interesting that I only have one for that. I'm not sure. So maybe maybe what, Arn's, what? maybe Arn's fouling or fouling, quote-unquote, is, you know, manager run-ins um, are not yeah, accountable for I've, I think it's no. They are. They are. I do. I do count. If 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 somebody on the outside does something that benefits you, I do count that. I think it's maybe because it didn't benefit Cody. Mm, that might be. And then arguably, I should still count it as a foul. Um. So it's maybe just I've maybe just made that decision in the moment to just be like, oh, whatever. It didn't didn't help. That's fair. Um. But I think I think if I was thinking about it, um, over more time, it would probably be another foul. All of these, all of the stats collected are collected specifically by you. So, I imagine yeah, there is yeah. some sort of five percent plus or minus margin of error <laughs> to all oh, of the stats. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like this is this is all open to human error. Um, I would like I I think somebody needs to like properly probe me on this at some point because I do wonder if people like look at this and go, eh, this could be absolute nonsense. I think if somebody like properly questioned me on this and then i gave the answers and how i do this i think it might hold more weight because if if i'm unsure on whether or not somebody threw four strikes or five strikes in an an exchange i will put a question mark next to it in my book and go back to it at the end so i i do really try to make it as accurate as possible but at the same time i'm a human being and there's a human margin for error you know, yeah, I would say ninety-five percent plus. Um, I, I would say that there will be some matches where, um, based on my definition of what these things are, it's it's pretty much a hundred percent. But there will be other times where it's you know not as good as that. I mean, at the end of the day, it's still a, a tough task. I still think you're doing a great mm-hmm. job. Um, one last thing yeah. before we move on from this graph, I think there is the huge elephant in the room that is the negative. The 166% decrease in strike downs. Numbers wise, Mm -hmm. that is in the TNT matches, he had one point, he averaged 1.6 strike downs per match. Of course, if you don't know, Mm -hmm. strike down is when you hit your opponent so hard that they fall over. Uh, Previously in 2020, he had 4.25 strike downs a match. So a, so a, a large decrease there. What do you? What's your take on that? I also have his previous singles matches pulled up here. If you want to know that as well, Craig. But what's your take on that? That large decrease. Um. So I think that because Cody was put into the first um title match, well, not the first title match, but the first big title match against Jericho, and then I think they they maybe had they I don't know when the TNT title became an idea that was going to happen, but I think Cody was always going to be used for something big. And I can remember near the beginning when I was looking through who had the good offense percentages and who didn't. Like it was noteworthy that Kenny Omega tended to allow his opponents to have more offense, and it was noteworthy. Um, you know, things like Lance Archer stood out as not having as much offense as his opponents. But I can remember when I first started looking at this kind of thing that Cody was somebody that was always booked strongly. He always he gen uh, he generally had. Uh, a chunk more than 50% in his matches. And then when you look at at this, uh, these matches here, we're, we're finding that Cody is often underneath in, mm-hmm. out of all of these matches, five of, five of them are under 50%, one of them is 50%, and the others are over 50%. So gen- in this title reign, he's tended to give more to his opponents. So it seems to me that Cody ha- has been booked strong, so he could get into this position and then when he was in this position 
there wasn't as much of a need for him to be booked as strongly because he already had the belt. So it became more about putting over Ricky Starks, putting over Mark Quinn, putting over Kingston Warhorse, Scorpio Sky, and then and then to end up with putting over Brody Lee like he's Brock Lesnar. So yeah, I, I think I think the reasoning for the diff, the change in how Cody has been presented in his matches is simply because of where he was in the card. He was he was being established, and then when he was established, he was used to establish others in kayfabe you can easily write it out at write this off as you know uh each he's looking weaker in this title reign because mm-hmm. he's wrestling week in and week yep. out practically you can easily and the trend out. line the trend line fits into that uh but also you know pull the curtain you can also talk about how it's cody's been booked strong like you said and it's burning that cody rhodes cachet you know, we mm-hmm. know that Cody Rhodes is going to be gone at the end of this t- title reign. So why not use what we've built up for a little bit to hype up, you know, Jungle Boy, Archer, Starks, Kingston, Warhorse, Sky, and burn the rest of it down with Dark Order's Brody Lee. Uh, so, you know, why not Why not use those things now? We've been building it all up. Let's Let's use it to help make other people look good. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's essentially what wrestling's supposed to be about. You build somebody up and then you establish somebody else because having the same person on top for ten years, um, I don't know, like some kind of brightly colored, clad, child friendly wrestler will put off everybody else. Or if you you know, put off, put kind of ruins your fans' interest, or if you have some other guy that um, I don't know, marries into some kind of powerful family and then just decides he's the best wrestler in the world for 10 years and, you know, doesn't ever put anybody over, doesn't put over Booker T at WrestleMania, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Then it, it doesn't really do the company as a whole any good. And I think that, you know, AEW are smarter than that. Cody Rhodes is smarter than that. And they they didn't want... They, you know, they don't want John Moxley to turn into John Cena. And they don't want Cody Rhodes to turn into Triple H. And you know, it's not, it's not going to happen. Yeah, I, I totally agree. I totally agree. I, I'm, I'm assuming at this point we're just, you know, guessing that we don't have a very pro WWE listenership, and this is fine. There is the concern that this episode peaks up a lot of interest in people and it brings in a lot of pro WWE fans. But at the same time, if you're pro WWE, why'd you click on a Cody TNT title reign deep dive? <laughs> so you can complain about it afterwards. <laughs> oh, you can you can share it into a, a DM chat, a group chat, and complain about it. Um, yeah, let's keep moving along here. Let's move on to the next table that I have presented here. And in conjunction chart, I'm, maybe we'll talk about both at the same time, Craig. Um, mm-hmm. So we have two things here. We have a table uh, that sort of talks about the move usage difference between Cody and his opponents. So I wrote down all of Cody's, you know, strikes, strike downs, grapples, dives, did the exact same thing for Cody's opponents. Um, so in the Archer match, Cody had 41 strikes. In, the, in, in that same match, Archer, ha- Archer had 30 strikes. The difference then comes out to be that in that Archer match, Cody had 11 more strikes than Lance Archer. So as you can see in that table, there's mm-hmm. a big old 11. Any, yeah. t- any category you can say, whatever terminology you want to use here, that Cody had more than his opponent is green. Anything red is mm-hmm. negative. I didn't count up the total, but it definitely feels like there's more gr- more red than green. So kind of going to the I, same I theory just, we were talking. I just, did that. I just did that. So there are thirteen, there are thirteen columns here. Mm-hmm. Um, so a good, a good, uh, a, a good number of the columns to win would be seven. And um, based on what you've got totaled up at the side, he gets seven against Scorpio Sky, and he gets eight against Jungle Boy. And all of the rest of them, it's lower than seven. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, and then the other chart that's here as well is just sort of that same sort of table in a different sort of manner visually. It's sort of a Craig and I don't know exactly waterfall chart, stacked bar chart, whatever. Uh, it's a chart nevertheless, but it's sort of a visual, no, another visual way to talk about this information where you can sort of see 
the dominance of Cody or the dominance of other people like an Archer, Eddie Kingston, or even mm-hmm. even Brody Lee. I mean, you can you can see that um, you can see that Brody Lee. <laughs> Basically, it's it's a very small thing, but if you look at it, Brody Lee beat Cody in every single category except for one, which was strikes. And we'll get to I mean, that it was as well. Three minute match. That's also true. Uh, what yeah. are your takeaways from these things before I start talking about my shtick? Uh, well, I did have a nice little inner giggle when I was looking at the strike down rate for the Brody Lee match with the minus 44% in favor of Brody <laughs> Lee. Uh, that's, that's, that sticks out. That's quite good. Um, the Brody Lee one's also interesting in that Cody wins the strike column and then nothing else, which again comes as no surprise to anybody that watched that match. Um, but also, I yeah, just want to say yeah. it, he wins it by having three more strikes than uh, yeah. than um, Brody Lee. But also, kind of going into the idea that you and I pitched that Brody Lee had less strikes, but four strike downs compared to zero of yeah. Cody's. So maybe there's an idea to Hosses have more strike downs. The more strike downs they have, the less strikes they have. So I wonder if that could be as well. Yeah. And the other thing that I do in the flow of offense charts is I weight the moves. So it's like it's one point for a strike, three for a strike down, four for grapple, five for a dive. Uh, one point for every five seconds of submission, and then 10 points for a finisher. So Cody got 12 strikes. That was it. Um, So you'd have 12 points in that uh, with based on that scale, whereas Brody Lee um, would have... Nine plus 12? Like 35 points. He would have so, He would have the same number of points in just strike downs as yeah, Cody yeah, strikes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So it's um, it's it's not even close when you start like waiting things like that. Um, yeah, he got murdered by Brody Lee essentially. <laughs> uh, and yeah. Speaking about that, uh, I did also like count up the number of wins in each category and sort of I was trying to see like which was you know Cody's best performance one could say mm-hmm. and which was his worst and what was his best category that he did during this title reign. If you can see on the right side of that table there, number of wins in category number one, his best performance was against Jungle Boy, defeating Jungle Boy in eight out of 13 categories. So very good job. Followed up, like you said, with Scorpio Sky, and then a tie for third with, who is this? This is tie for third between Mark Quinn and Sonny Kiss. So those were Cody's best four performances um, in his... TNT title reign. His worst performance, very obvious. We already knew that. Brody Lee, he not only lost, which also goes to say he lost, and this is his worst performance. It completely makes sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, followed up by then the Eddie Kingston, where he only won in three of the 13 mm-hmm. categories. Then up next to Jake Hager, where he won four out of 13 categories. And then it gets to five, where we have like a three-way tie with a bunch of people um but yeah i mean i think that all makes sense to me i mean you you look at that and i and to me i'm like oh this all that all makes sense that all tracks Mm brody lee's worst is his worst performance where he lost the title jungle boy was his best which was his first defense um i think it all makes sense in the same vein, I did the same idea with the certain categories, the move usage categories. So Cody's best category of move usage, which was grapples, which is you know anything like a grapple, anything like a slam, the sort of like power yeah. move mentalities. His worst move usage was dives. Um, he only won in two out of ten matches in dives. Um, that was against Hager and Eddie Kingston. So not a lot of dives coming from Cody. I mean, he's not really a dive guy to begin with, but uh, I remember dive guys. Remember when that was a thing? Anyways. Um, dive guys, what does that mean? There was a controversy a couple of years ago where it was like, I think it was Will Ospreay and Randy Orton were complaining to each other about like, I'm a dive guy and I'm not a dive guy. Right. Some, some, something like Sounds that. Terrible. <laughs> Sounds like a lot of, I believe Will Ospreay made t-shirts from it and they did not oh, sell quickly. For... Oh, did it not? Hmm. Um... But yeah, so there's that table there. There's also the chart accompanying it. Um, I am. Um, I like the waterfall chart. I think that really um, shows off what we've been talking about 
Um, in the matches against Jungle Boy, Mark Quinn and Sonny Kiss, Cody is putting over that he is bigger than his opponents by putting them in submission holes and grinding them down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and those, as you can see, are... What a good point and well made without no without any fluffs. No edits whatsoever. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, third take. Uh, so there's... Yeah, and you can see even then, like that... I would... Based on... Let me look at the table real quickly. Yeah, I would say that... Those three matches, 64 more seconds than Sonny Kiss, uh, 46 more than Mark Quinn, 45. His three biggest, like, differentials. I mean, submission seconds is also, like, a hard thing to, you know, it's a way bigger number than a lot of these other categories. But he's just dominating in these categories compared to other people. Those are easily his best performances um, out of this whole kit and caboodle. Uh, and I do like that. I do like that. I mean, you sort of mentioned at the top of the show that he might have decided as a game plan to go for more of that submission route. I mean, we've always seen him building up his submission game, but he might have decided, hey, let me do some more submissions this time around. Hopefully, you know, that could... I'm not doing a bunch of power moves. I can just sort of like sit there as I'm you know, rain, you know uh, mm-hmm. wrangling a leg or something. Um, it's a way to tear down your opponent without exerting too much energy, if you will. Yeah, 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 absolutely. Well, then let's move on to the final point of discussion in this episode. Again, you can find more, much, so much more of me talking about it, talking about this deep dive and that companion article on ProWrestlingMusings.com. And of course, you know, and if you liked it, I would love to hear feedback of whether or not you enjoy this mm. deep dive. You know, there's always more... Uh, champions that will lose their titles eventually so maybe there's more stuff we can do so if you enjoy this definitely tell us but uh as moving to the final part i was sort of picking up as we were looking through the combing through your stats craig i sort of was picking up this idea and i've kind of mentioned it that there was a big difference in cody's game plan when he was fighting you know normal matchups versus what i called hoss matchups normal matchups where anyone was like jungle boy mark quinn ricky starks Sunny Kiss, War Horse, and Scorpio Sky, Hosses being Lance Archer, Hager, Kingston, and Lee. And I was sort of seeing that there is a little bit of a difference between what Cody's game plan was. Looking at the first chart here, Cody's average move usage during normal matchups versus Hoss matchups. What are your sort of takeaways from this one? Um, I I think it's a very it's a very good thing to notice, and I think this chart, like with without a shadow of doubt, really makes that point. Um you're you're so again when you're this chart is designed to compare uh, Cody's offense against you're calling them normal matchups and then their horse matchups and um, Cody's average strikes against um uh, smaller opponents is almost nine nine um was that nine strikes per match is that right or is it per yes. hour Not per per match per match per match so yeah he's like um nine strikes per match less against small opponents kind of and that that fits into what i was describing earlier about how horses tend to take more strikes to put over the fact that they're big and strong and immovable however then we when we look at strike downs um it's it's going back to the thing yeah they're getting hit a lot but they don't go down strike downs as uh, 0.75 per match versus horses 1.83 per match versus the smaller guys He's hitting more grapples against smaller guys, but he's hitting more dives against bigger guys because if you can't hit, get them to the map via strike downs and hitting them with grapples is harder, then you take to the sky, and that's what Cody does. Um, he's also using submissions more against the little guys. That's probably more of an aesthetic choice in that having him grinding down the little, littler guys kind of... Um, that's more for the match setup and for them having comebacks. You could argue that he should use more submission against the bigger guys because that's another way that wrestlers should logically choose to approach um, bigger wrestlers. Interestingly, reversals are more for the little guys and um, bigger guys, I suppose, less reversals because there are less hope spots to again put over that they're bigger guys and they're strong and they're powerful and. You need to take your chances against them. Um, more pin attempts versus little guys. Again, you don't want the big guy to be on his back for too many op- uh, too many occasions because that kind of, again, undermines him. 
Um, he's doing slightly more fouls against the bigger guys. So, you know, he's being driven to it. More taunts against the little guys makes more sense. Can't taunt a big guy that's beating you up. Um, <laughs> more finishers against the little guys. Um, he's perhaps using other tactics to finish off the match against the bigger guys. Um, you cited the roll up against Hager. Um, yeah, Ryan, I've just kind of spoken for a huge amount of time about a chart that you put lots of hard work into i hope i've left something for you to say no definitely uh there's a lot of different things in here that i greatly enjoy i mean it's that same sort of idea that there is that connection of the less strikes you throw the more strike downs you have i mean in normal matchups mm -hmm. he has less strikes more strike downs and hosses he has more strikes but less strike downs this whole chart also really does a great job of showcasing how AEW books hosses, how do they book heavyweights? Mm. Um, like you said, you would think that a good tactic for taking down big guys is to grind them down submission wise, submission style. Yeah. But it's, you know, a lot of submissions happen on the mat. And if you're, if these big guys are not on the mat and you're not striking them down, you're not going to be able to get, submit them. Uh, it's going exactly. to be incredibly yeah. difficult. I mean, they, he had, um, twice as many sum seconds of submission in normal matchups than Haas matchups. Um, so just g easily go right there. He can knock those small scrawny boys down and grind them up in various holds, locks, what have you, figure fours, if you will. Uh, pin attempts, I think, is very interesting. The fact that um, he has way more than double the amount of pin attempts in normal matches than uh, Haas matchups. You sort of allude to the idea that it could be the same sort of idea. Hosses are not on the ground as often than normal guys. Yeah. Um, so if you can't pin them if they're not on the ground. But still, it's the same sort of idea. Like, I want to try to pin my opponent because the longer I'm in that match, the likelihood that they're going to beat me in <laughs> gets a little bit higher. So, you know, you want to put maybe pin more, Cody. Maybe that could have helped you with Brody. I don't know. Mm. I mean, that's a whole other thing. You got crushed in Brody. Uh, I like I like that there's more than double, almost triple the amount of taunts in normal matchups. Like it's that same sort of idea. You sort of said like you know you can't taunt if you're getting punched in the face, <laughs> but I like yeah. the idea that Cody was like so confident against people that were his size or smaller that he's just like taunting tr tr almost triple as many times as big guys. Like he took the big guys seriously more seriously mm -hmm. if you will um than the smaller I think, guys I think, um, I think that comes into what we were trying to figure out earlier when people were saying that cody was becoming heel i'm pretty sure he's he, well he was he was doing that um push-ups taunt thing um against i don't know if it was warhorse or scorpio sky but yeah one of those matches yeah i mean he which is a heel taunt 100 percent, 100 percent. i mean it, you talk about this being a marathon and he's definitely like when he's 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 not trying to end the match he's trying to like show showcase his bravado yeah. a little bit and like okay cody let's let's try to put yeah. the match away here buddy yeah come on cody you don't see paula radcliffe running over the marathon line backwards you know you need to stay focused yeah exactly exactly i th there's a lot of other things in this chart i greatly enjoy um, we talked about dives is another point you said. I thought you brought up a great point about how he has double the amount of dives in Haas matches. Like if you can't knock him down, then try to get to the aerial skies to knock him down. Not not a stat we can look back on, but I wonder. Like I don't know, probably not a huge thing, but dive dive downs. Like how many times hmm. you down an opponent oh, with a dive? Yeah. Well, it's it's a, it's it's like almost always i i think yeah. for that stat to be of value it'd be like the amount of effort it would be to like make that start happen versus how useful it would be i don't think would be much of a payoff it would only I'm be afraid. it would be only interesting to me when it comes to like super heavyweight matches like that yeah yeah um, it's only like it's brock lesnar versus oh i don't know zach gowan i, I can't even think <laughs> I also thought it was interesting that Cody had less reversals in big big man matches than normal mm -hmm. man matches. Uh, three on average, three less reversals a match. 
against these bigger guys. Why do you think that is? Why do you think Cody is reversing less? You would think that he's trying to reverse more. Is it just the power that he isn't able to reverse against? Or is it something else? Um, it, it must be to do with keeping those guys strong, like continuing to put them over. Um, it it looks it looks weak if you are being reversed and um, when when the offense being transferred back over to Cody in those matches, then it it will be like less often. Um, so when when the big guys lose control of the match to Cody, it's you know they they don't want that to happen too often because it will make um, them look bad. So moving on to the next chart. Looking at this, we're looking at Cody's average match offense percentage, average strike down rate percentage, average reversal rate percentage between both normal matchups and Haas matchups. As you can see on this chart, Cody has less match offense percentage on average compared to Haas's, 2% less. Um, so not like a huge difference, but when you're talking about how the average is like 52%, we're talking the, you know, it's not a 2% can be a lot, I guess is what I'm trying to say. Yeah, yeah, elite sports, uh, small margins, absolutely. Uh, and then, to me, there's the big one right there about strike down rate, and it's the same sort of idea of how they're protecting their big guys. The strike down rate for Cody is on average 11% in normal matchups versus big men, where Cody was only ha- able to have, on average, 1.5% of a strike down rate. Um, mm. and, and many of those matches... Uh, and both Hager and Brody Lee, he had 0%. Archer, 2 Eddie Kingston, 4 So a barely able to strike down these big guys. And like we said, we started at the top of the show, said in the last graph, you're not striking down these bigger guys. They're being protected. They're too big for someone smaller They're smaller than them. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's, it's a big difference. Um, 11% versus 1.5% of uh, strikes re- resulting in strike down for Cody against these guys is is that's a that's a monumental uh, that's a monumental change 10% versus 1% essentially um yeah the the reversal rate is interesting you might have thought that um, it might be higher against the horses you know like squirming out of power moves um but i suppose he's potentially Rev- uh, reversing less strikes if there are heavy strikes that are resulting in strike downs. Um, that, that's the only kind of logic um, or narrative I can kind of piece together for that one. Yeah, I wonder if there is some sort of connection between someone's reversal rate and mm-hmm. how many strike downs they're giving. If that makes sense. their strike down rate, I guess. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, potentially. Like you, uh, or maybe, or maybe it's strike down rate that they, you're receiving. Maybe it's that that you are getting manhandled and beaten down more by another mm-hmm. opponent. So it's harder and overpowered, I would argue, probably than another opponent. Uh, so it's harder, maybe to reverse their moves because you're being overpowered and just getting beaten down. Possibly. Um, I'm, I'm just trying to pull up the actual full chart to take note of, ah, here we go. So um, the wrestlers in AEW that have the best reversal rates, if it will just load, here we go. Um, so the wrestlers that have the best reversal rates in AEW are Wardlow, Colt Cabana, Ricky Starks, Ray Phoenix, Ray Phoenix, Warhorse, Brandon Cutler, Peter Avalon, Scorpio Sky, Jack Evans. So the guys with the better reversal rates are the are the guys mainly are guys that you think would be slippery and would get out, like okay. Phoenix, Starks, Cabana, Avalon, Sky. Um, the the guys with the worst reversal rates are Jericho, Kingston, Archer, Cage, Luther. It's it's all your horses. Um, yeah, weird. Cody's just an anomaly there. I think. Who has the best reversal rate and who has the highest strike down rate? Um, 
So the best reversal rate there was Wardlow, but Wardlow has been in... Um, so the, the cage match doesn't, doesn't count for this chart because it's non-traditional. Um, so Wardlow has had five squashes. So he essentially doesn't count. Okay. Colt Cabana does loads of reverses, but he kind of does it in a, in a comedic way. You're then on to Ricky Starks, Ray Phoenix, Cutler, Avalon, and Sky. So it, it's reversals are a hallmark of quick guys in AEW. Okay. Who is, um, and who has the best strike down rate? So when we're looking at strike down rates, um, it's page 10, Billy Gunn to begin with, or Tease, oddly. Uh, but then it's starting to make more sense. Wardlow, Jeff Cobb, Lance Archer, Brody Lee. And then we're into Scorpio Sky and Sammy Guevara, oddly. But I suppose theirs is coming from um, kind of like flying clotheslines and stuff like that. So it's like it's the horses that with the strike down rates, which again makes complete sense. So Cody's lack of reversal rate against the bigger. Uh, well, I, I suppose Cody maybe just doesn't have the speed that you need to be able to take on a horse. That could be a fair idea. Because he... you need to be able to reverse. So maybe if we had, in fact, if, if we had somebody like Ray Phoenix going up against Archer and Lee, um, my guess would be is that their reversal rate would be higher than Cody's because they would be slipping out of a lot of things and it would have been more of a cat and mouse type game. Whereas the way that Cody wrestles, he doesn't ever you know, take up the role of the mouse against the bigger cat. No, I would definitely agree with that. Even even when it, he's getting utterly destroyed by Brody Lee, I would not describe that as a cat and mouse game. That is very much mm -hmm. just a guy eating his dinner. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's just cat food. Cody is cat food. <laughs> Hashtag. That's the weirdest, weirdest metaphor. <laughs> but yeah, but I... I'm quite proud of that one. There we go. I love it. That's good statistical analysis. I love We're it. Good at this. Yeah, deep dive, everybody. If you greatly enjoyed this deep dive, as I hope you did, um, you know, definitely uh, tweet about it, retweet it. I would, I would appreciate it. All the hard work. We would both appreciate all the hard work. Um, and yeah, and if you also, if you really liked it, definitely let us know because we're, you know, we can easily do this again. Whether or not go crazy again is one thing, but fragile egos. Say it again. We have fragile egos. Please retweet. Please retweet. Please retweet. Please retweet. That's how you get all of our ego boosted. Um, yeah, no, I mean, it, I don't want to. I don't want to speak too much about how the amount the amount of work put in, but it would definitely be. We would definitely both appreciate it. Um, and of course, if you liked it, we definitely want to hear about it. Um, what you liked, what you didn't like, what information, sort of ideas, questions you want to yeah. have further. Oh, Ryan's Ryan's mobile number is. Oh 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 oh. Um, no, yeah, we would definitely appreciate it. So you can both, you can tweet your thoughts, I guess, at us. My cat just is eating something behind me. Uh, sounds like paper. Cody. Oh, it's, <laughs> it's cat food. Oh God, it's Cody. Uh, uh, so you can tweet about your thoughts about it all by tweeting at me at hit the books pod, or you can tweet at Craig at Craig PW musings, or of course at PW musings for more statistical thoughts there no new japan but i'm glad we got it out in the preamble of the show craig oh it's done that's all it needed that's all we needed uh yeah again thank you so much for everybody for listening you can subscribe to this podcast feed for more content like this uh and of course you can check out the companion article that was written for prowrestlingmusings.com so you can always go there and check that out there uh, and of course, if you want to, you know, next time, if you want to watch a video version of the show, you can always do that by heading over to the YouTube channel, hit the books podcast and uh, checking out the video versions of there. You can just type in wrestling with statistics, hit the books episode, whatever. One of those key phrases will certainly get you where you need to get to. Uh, Craig, any final thoughts or words of wisdom or just plugs to make? Uh, I, I think I'm I think I'm all out for this episode. Um, he ended just, high yeah. on Cody is cat food. Yeah, I don't know, but like um, I really really enjoyed this one. I think the article is immense and of high quality. Yeah, no, uh, thanks Ryan for putting that together. It's been really really interesting to chat about all those um, quite insightful um, kind of use of comparative stats. I don't know. I think you get the gist of what I'm trying to say. Yeah. No, I appreciate that. I, I try to 
that and I that's why I've always viewed my role in the show is that you're the stats guy and I'm the analytics guy. I'll look at your stats and try to derive some sort of meaning from it or just mess with them until I get some sort of story. Um, mm-hmm. and I and I think also that's kind of what analytics are is that you're kind of just messing yeah. with stats to sort of get something from it. And that's also what I love about doing this show and what you do over at Pro Wrestling Musings and what we do here, wrestling with statistics, mm-hmm. is that the none of these wrestlers none and we sort of talked about it. none of the wrestlers not tony khan not vince mcmahon not anyone in new japan not even down to your local indie are thinking like oh i'm gonna punch you 14 times you're gonna fall over two of those times you're not mm-hmm. obvious no it's insane to think like that but you what could. We, you could you could but it would be an insane thing to do uh, but what we're trying to, but what we do here is we look at the numbers after the fact and find what those stories are, and not just on a match to match level, but as we saw here, on a title reign level, just seeing mm-hmm. what yep. the story of these matches were. Was it? Did Cody get really lucky during the Hager match? Did he have a different sort of idea when it came to hosses versus normal guys? It reveals a little bit of how they book wrestlers in AEW, but not only that, it reveals how they book a title reign on a very small Mm -hmm. scope. So, you know, that's the whole point of what we're trying to do here is showcase what the numbers, what stories those numbers are telling. And it's, you know, our job, I guess, to uh, tell you those stories, folks. Yeah, and I think we could, um, now that we've done this one, we could definitely do this again. Like, there's no no reason why, um, you know, we'll, we'll end up with all the John Moxley stats at the end of his title reign. We, um, I, I think, I think Page and Omega's title reign is coming to a close. Oh yeah. Um, I probably have. Well, I, I, I probably have most of their title matches as a graphic. I certainly have all their title matches in my notebook. So yeah, we can. This is. I know. I really like this format. We can. We can definitely do this again. Yes. So we'll definitely see us back next time when we discuss Toru Yano's King of Pro Wrestling. <laughs> <laughs> title reign so get ready for that that hot drop uh in all of your feeds so again thank you everybody what a, looking, what a crappy looking trophy it was as well it looked like the, it's like a kid's football trophy <laughs> it's like a participation trophy that he won yeah. <laughs> i love that it's okada's idea and he didn't even win the damn thing he's not bothered by it he's like whatever <laughs> Here. i got the climax coming up i'll just focus yeah. on that instead um, oh, he need to ditch that stupid money clip, co- Cobra Clutch. Go back to the like the 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 manipulation of the risk. The, oh, I can't even talk now. I'm talking too much. The manipulation of the wrist and manipulating opponents into the rainmaker like kind of situation has been like one of the most dramatic things about New Japan for years. And they've just thrown it out of the window for this really boring Baron Corbin money clip situation. <laughs> I love I love New Japan sometimes. It's just mm. wild that what happens. Uh but again, yeah, thank you everybody for listening on that note. <laughs> Do you know also Okada's thirty two, going back Abushi's what, thirty eight? Yeah. Evil, evil is uh, voices of wrestling pointed this out. Evil is older than Okada. Oh my God, Ibushi's mm. uh, yeah, Ibushi's thirty eight. Yeah, it's Okada. <laughs> it's Okada has put in a lot of uh, hard work, so I'm not yeah. surprised that he his body needs a little bit of a, a relaxation mm. period. Yeah. Uh, but yes, again, thank you everybody for listening to this week's episode of Wrestling of Statistics. We'll be back next week with an all new episode discussing whatever we would like, whatever we loved from the previous week of wrestling, what sort of matches we liked. I don't know what's on the docket. Um, I don't entirely know what's on the docket. There's some interesting things coming out of Dynamite, I think. Oh, wait, um, no. Um, next week. Maybe, well, next, later. Will next week be. Next week might be a later episode because this upcoming yeah. Saturday is all out yeah so yeah this next week we'll probably be discussing all out and discussing everything that happens there so i guess if you like the aew talk get ready for more next week um so yeah thank you everybody for listening to this week's episode i gave all the plugs earlier so again thank you everybody on behalf of craig and me 
Thank you so much for listening. We appreciate all the love. And we'll see you all next time. See you next week. Bye.